So I'm um, Peter Hutchinson, I'm the Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Cambridge, UK. I'm Carol Turner, the Research Manager for the Society of British Neurosurgeons in the UK. And I'm uh, Angelo Scolias, I'm a Clinical Lecturer in Neurosensory at the University of Cambridge and a member of the EANS Research Committee. The Rescue ICP study was designed to answer one of the really important questions after a head injury. Head injury caused by trauma to the head results in brain swelling. The brain swells within the tight skull and this increases the pressure in the head which can affect the blood supply and the oxygen supply to the brain. One of the ways we can try and treat that if we can't use the conventional methods is actually quite a radical approach which is removing part of the skull and putting the scalp back over the brain. And that's an operation that has been tried for a number of years but what we don't actually know is whether it improves outcome for the patient both in terms of saving their life and also the quality of that survival. So the study uh, was set up several years ago. It's a collaboration between the University of Cambridge and centres within the UK and many centres within the EANS as well. And what we did was we randomised 400 patients. So patients with high brain pressure were randomised to either having an operation, the bone removal, an operation called a craniectomy, or medical treatment, ongoing medical treatment to try and control the raised pressure. So we randomised 400 patients, approximately 200 patients in each arm, and then we followed these patients for up to two years in order to try and assess whether the operation led to better outcomes than the medical treatment. And we're pleased to say that the study has finished, the results have been analysed, and the results will be presented for the first time uh, at the EANS meeting in Athens uh, on, on Thursday morning. So uh, we're looking forward to being able to, to share this information and we hope that it will be useful in terms of guiding clinicians and helping clinicians guide their families into the uh, role of this operation. The Rescue ICP study was the first study that we conducted, but we are also conducting another study which also looks at the effect of the benefit of removing the bone but this is in a different sort of head injury called acute subdural hematoma. So patients with a blood clot on the brain, the acute subdural hematoma, are randomised once the blood clot has been removed at surgery to leaving the bone out, a craniectomy, or putting the bone back, what we call a, a craniotomy. So that's a study that has started. It's ongoing. We've managed to randomise 120 patients in that study. We're looking for new centres, new collaborations, particularly through the the EANS to, to join that study and make sure we recruit enough patients in order to answer that important question. The web page of the, of the SPNS is live, the EANS, we have got a directory. It's not an interactive directory yet, but we hope maybe we can produce an interactive one in the future. Uh, the actual web page is there for the trials. Uh, we are just would like to extend it further. Yes, I think so. More randomised trials, we require large numbers. It's becoming more and more important we get large cohorts. So the more collaboration we can do with people in other countries, then the better. It's quite important that we do multi-centre trials and a lot of collaborative research. And we've set up a research section of the British Society of Neurosurgeons webpage, and we're trying to emulate that with the EANS as well where we will have a directory of neurosurgeons who are interested in research so that we can do collaborative studies in the future and also a database of all the trials around Europe so we can hopefully um, help for recruitment in all these centres. We know that after brain injury the brain is swollen, that was one of the uh, concepts in the Rescue ICP study but what's really important is for us to know exactly what's happening to that injured brain and we can do that through this concept of neuromonitoring on patients with severe brain injury on an intensive care unit. And we do that by inserting very fine probes through a hole in the skull into the brain itself. And that can measure very important parameters such as brain pressure, so how swollen the brain is and how we can measure pressure, how pressure responds to the treatment that we give. We can also measure the amount of oxygen that gets into the brain Again, very important in terms of brain survival, cells require oxygen. To measure oxygen directly is very helpful and when it's low we can administer different treatments, give the patient more oxygen through, through the ventilator or change the blood pressure to try and improve oxygenation. And the third thing we can measure is a, a slightly newer technique called microdialysis and this enables us to measure the chemistry of the brain 
important substrates that the brain depends on, the nutrients such as glucose, how glucose is delivered to the brain, and we can also work out how the brain uses glucose. So we've got a much better handle now on what's happening to the injured brain in terms of pressure, oxygen and chemistry. We've now been able to show that these parameters, when they go wrong, when they're deranged, relate to poor outcome for the patient. And what we do now is apply therapy to correct these parameters when they're abnormal, bring them back to normality, uh, and the whole aim being to, to not only improve survival for the patient, but ensure that that survival is, is of good quality. Train is essentially are the future of a neurosurgery, not just in Europe, but also worldwide. So we think that it's very important to include trainees in research from very early on, because obviously the sooner you uh, uh, get trained in conducting uh, research, then the better you will eventually become. Uh, and in fact, nowadays, uh, there are several studies in the United Kingdom that include medical students, so as, as early as medical school years. Um, there are different ways of involving trainees. Uh, the traditional ways of uh, perhaps doing a research degree, like a PhD, uh, is one of those ways. And there is support available, there is funding available as well uh, through uh, the Medical Research Council, the Royal College of Surgeons in the UK, for example. Um, other traditional ways, again, perhaps to conduct a small single centre study, so write up a few cases, uh, perhaps a case report. But a newer method that we have um, developed in the last few years is the concept of, of a trainee collaborative. So this is a network of trainees working together, coming from different units, uh, and this concept was developed in the UK. Um, so the trainees in the UK have formed a network and we have collaborated together and in the first study um, which looked at patients with chronic subdural hematomas we collected data on 1200 patients from 26 different UK units so obviously this increases the size increases the ability to um, come up with results that can be replicated across many different uh, uh, settings uh, and this is uh, uh, hopefully now a model that we can uh, develop in the rest of Europe, <coughs> hopefully through the EANS Research Committee. The Research Foundation is a, a new venture for the EANS that's been proposed by the board, by the President and, and my role as the Secretary. The ENS has a fantastic track record in training through the ENS training courses. What we're trying to do now is, is a new avenue in terms of promoting research by establishing a foundation that will provide funding for research projects. So we're looking at various ways by which we can fundraise for the foundation. There's various options available to us. And then we're also looking at the best ways that we could spend the funds. And there's a number of ideas that we have at the moment. What we're really keen to do is, is promote young researchers, young trainee neurosurgeons, as, as Angelos has, has discussed, to try and give them some funding early stage of their career towards their higher degrees. For example, perhaps the first year of a PhD. The second would be to pump prime or seed small research projects, enable people to get pilot data, then they can apply to the, the bigger funding uh, agencies. And the third thing we'd like to do with the foundation is to support the EANS clinical trials registry that Carol mentioned, uh, give us some uh, funding providing for that to get the registry off the ground uh, and uh, hopefully these three facets will, will, will come together and make the foundation a very worthwhile venture.